I made some tomato basil soup with some Parmesan cheese. Doesn't that sound good right now? But the best part of the meal was the bread. It was basil, tomato, garlic, with big chunks of garlic in it. I had just heated it up, put some butter on it. It was about a half a loaf. Yeah, I eat a lot. And it was so good. That bread with that soup on a cold day. There's something about hot soup on a cold day with some bread. You know, I was just in Dana Heaven eating, <laughs> which I do quite a lot. And it was, it was enough for the day. You know, that was my, my meal of the day. It was just satisfying, just the aroma of garlic and the bread. And I was satisfied that, it's that it wasn't that cheap bread either. It was that stuff you get at Big Y that's expensive and it had just really good stuff, stick to your gut stuff, you know, that grandma would make. And it reminds me of what Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He, all who eat this bread will never die. He was talking about himself. There's another scripture that says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Every word. Every word. And I'm finding myself needing that bread, being hungry like in the autumn time when it's cold, the world, the earth, uh, the, the, it seems there's just a lot of stuff going on. It's cold. People are cold. But amen, we find... We find warmth in the presence of the Lord in his word and the comfort of his word that if we trust and obey and do what he says, it's going to be all right for us. And any of those who obey too, the Lord, it'll work out. You'll be satisfied. Amen. You'll find joy and peace and happiness. You'll find it nowhere else. You'll find temporary happiness. But if you want the, the satisfaction of that stick to your gut kind of feeling, you'll find it in Jesus. Amen.
Nobody can be a Christian without doing it God's way. And nobody can live an overcoming life unless it's Jesus that lives the overcoming life in us. It's impossible for a human being to live for God. Absolutely impossible. Uh, there was a time before the cross when people walked with Jesus, only they didn't know who he was. They were just walking with the Spirit. That would be manifested in the flesh in a future time. But there was a time when people had many rules to follow, many commandments. And it just seems when you read the Old Testament, you just have so many, so many uh, guidelines. And you may ask, how could anybody, <laughs> how could anybody live up to that? And the answer is, nobody can. In fact, just with the Ten Commandments alone that Moses brought down from the mountain, it's very difficult to find anybody that can keep all of that, just Ten Commandments. And it really comes down really to this. In the beginning, when God created man, he gave one rule, and it's still that rule today. He's trying to bring us all back to obey God Love the Lord and obey the Lord. In other words, don't go against God's instruction. Whatever, you, whatever it is you, you want to do out there, whatever fruit it is you want to partake of, whatever it is that you enjoy, whatever it is that makes you feel good, all these things you can do as long as you don't disobey God. So it's okay that I followed Brother Dana down the hall and spooked him a little bit while he was worshiping. <laughs> But I was obeying God while I did it. I mean, God didn't tell me to do that. But that was not the untouchable fruit. That was something I could do and get away with it because I'm a little mean sometimes. It's a little mean streak in me that's been with me ever since I was two years old. Uh, and I have fun with that. And God knows my heart. He knows that I'm as sincere as I can be about serving him. But in my foolishness, I'm just me. If you don't like it, you just be you. Because I may not like some things you do. Praise God. But I like you. Amen. And if you like bowling and you like to bowl, you go bowling. As long as you can do that and obey God, enjoy yourself and bowl. Now, I'm going to cross a few lines here that can get me kicked out of some churches. If you enjoy watching a good show on television, enjoy yourself. Just Obey God. There is a forbidden fruit. It's the same fruit that was forbidden in the beginning when God created man. And that is don't partake of the knowledge of good and evil. Just remember what's good. Don't go out there and try to mix evil with it. It won't work. So if you're living a life trying to be a Christian and... You're trying to mix some things in that you enjoy that you know God would not be pleased with this. Then why are you doing it? Live. 
April 3rd in my living room on my knees that God sent an angel I was puking blood getting ready to smoke me some rock I had a fifth of honey poop on one side six rocks in the hand and I couldn't stop puking blood I looked up in heaven and said Father I surrender soon as I said them words I stopped puking blood so you know what I did I took that fifth and poured it down the toilet I took them six rocks but I took five and I dumped it in the toilet but I kept one in my hand so one ain't gonna hurt. I could just do this last one. It's gonna be all right. Soon as I made my mind to do that, I started puking blood again. <laughs> now that will tell you how good God's mercy is. I took that last rock and dropped it. Just then I stopped puking blood. My wife was sitting in the living room. <laughs> She was getting ready to go to church. But for some reason, it just delayed her. I ran into, see, you ain't got to get saved in church. Don't get me, ain't nothing wrong with being saved in the church. But I ran into my living room, fell on my knees in front of my wife. Because she's a minister, you know that. I said, sweetheart, I'm ready to go home. See, God has showed me that, boy, I done brought you out of the pit of hell. See, when you got a God that can show you something in front of you, oh yeah, I'm scared of him, but I love him to death. And I'm going to tell you, when you find him, and I mean you truly find him, you ain't got to worry about having food on your table, money in your pocket, Clothes on your bed, a roof over your head. Cause God will provide. God will provide. And I'm here to tell you, I'm by my, my God, Jesus. And I'm not gonna let him go. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. And I'm glad about that. You know why I'm glad about that. Because can't nobody do me like Jesus. Shaboro <laughs> Shanda. Nobody can do me like Jesus. My friends can't do me like Jesus. My parents can't do me. My wife can't do me like Jesus. See, you can talk about me all you want, but see, my father in heaven got a hold on me. Because he said he'll never leave me or forsake me. And I'm standing on his word tonight. See, he did not just only raise Lazarus from the dead, but he raised me. <laughs> and I'm so glad. I'm so glad. He did not only make that blind man to walk and the blind man to see, because he gave me sight now. And I'm so glad. <laughs> There's so much good that we can partake of. Why dabble with the evil when you can enjoy the good? Because evil has penalties that come with it. Now, you may, you may try it for a while, and, and it may seem good for a season. Uh, I can tell you some people that have been trying to come to this church for the last several weeks, promising to be here in every service, and haven't showed up. Even today, some have said, I'll be there tonight. Definitely. They wanted to be here. But between that desiring to do which is good, that which is good, and the time that comes for the good that could be to be manifested, something gets their attention. There's something that gets their attention says, 
Well, you know, some things you don't have to do necessarily. There are other things you could enjoy on a Tuesday night. Uh, you know, you know, God may, you know, preacher may not like it, and church people may not understand it, but it makes you feel good, and it tastes good, and it seems okay, doesn't it? And you lie there on your couch or on your bed eating an orange and drinking your Kool-Aid, and you think, yeah, it's Tuesday night, and, and God even knows that every Tuesday night I go out and party. <laughs> or I, I, take, I enjoy what I like to snort or, or, you know, or smoke. Now, I'm not saying anything about anything in itself being evil, but the evil is knowing to do good and choosing to do wrong. Choosing that which is not good, even though it seems good, but in your knowledge of good and evil, amen, which has been handed down to us, when God gives us what it takes to live for him, he's trying to push the evil that we've gained knowledge of out of our lives, and only God can do that, because our human frame, when God sees us, he knows that we are dust. In his sight, if that's all we've got, we're no more than a worm before him. And there's going to come a time when hell is going to take in itself even uh, the devil and all those disobedient spirits of evil that cause so much trouble in the flesh. And it's going to be a place where the word worm is used. Even the worm cannot die. And if you didn't know that, God was calling you without his spirit in you a worm. That's what God sees all human beings as being. Now, you can listen to the crowd that says everybody's good, everybody's going to heaven. But when God sees them as a worm that's going to hell, it cannot die. You're just blowing smoke. That's not going to count in Judgment Day. God's not a mean God. He's not a harsh God. But just because somebody's related to you, that doesn't make them saved. Because you love them, that doesn't make them saved. That puts a big responsibility on the church to try to get the message out. That God is good. His way is right. And even if it doesn't seem right, it's still right. He tells us to search the scriptures for the, in them we think that we have eternal life. And then he says, and they are they which testify of me. So there seems to be a difference in reading the Bible, thinking you're doing the right thing, which you are, and then reading the Bible and finding the right thing and applying it to your life. Praise God. You can search the scriptures and it seems like it's the right thing. And he even become religious. A lot of people I've known through the years read the Bible all the time, but they never can seem to live for God. Amen. And there's others that can't even read that live for God all the time. Hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is not a rule. It's an opportunity to live a Christian life. If that's a rule to you and you just can't hardly live according to it because so many other things you want to do that seem to come before that, then you're seeing it all wrong and it seems like it's right, but it's not right. But seek you first the kingdom of God is just simply this. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. And the only way it can be done in the name of Jesus, even if you don't speak the name of Jesus, is just know that this is what Jesus likes. Hallelujah. Where's that brother that played the drums? I need some help here. Come on back over here and help me for a minute. Brother Rutledge, why don't you come help me here? I feel like singing a good old time song tonight. My grandma Ledbetter grew up in Pentecost. She came up under, under B.H. Height and Brother Harry Branding, some of the founders of Pentecost in the St. Louis area. She told me stories about the tent meetings when they'd, they'd be down in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, the sawdust. And people would stand back and say, you don't want to go up there in the sawdust and get down there at the altar and pray because the preacher sprinkles stuff in the sawdust and, and you'll fall out. We have the bottles of that for sale, $29.95. No. I, I wish it was that easy, but you know it really is that easy to come down and give your heart to the Lord. My grandma used to tell me, she said, I can take you to the spot I could take you to the moment. I could tell you the second that I bowed a knee and God forgave me of my sins. And I never forget the day. You remember the day he saved your soul? 
Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. This song says, I never shall, I never shall forget, the day forget the day when all the burdens of my soul were rolled away. It made me happy, be glad and free. I'll sing and shout it, boys, everything to me. Long years ago, went out in sin. I had no hope, I had no peace within, but down on my knees, in agony, I cried to Jesus, and he gladly set me free, and I never shall forget the day, hallelujah, when all the burden of my soul was to Jesus right now and at his dear feet all you gotta do is humbly bow come back to Jesus your every sin you cleanse your savior give you peace and joy with me I never shall, I never shall forget the day how you when all the burden of my soul was lost away Praise him again. You can't drown out your sorrow with booze. Now, I don't get up here and preach against beer, and I don't preach against alcohol. Let me tell you something about whiskey and beer and marijuana and all those things. None of those things are sin. If you never touch a bottle of alcohol, it'll never become sin in your life. If all the whiskey stores never sold another drop, none of that would be sin. That would just be liquid in a bottle. Amen. What makes it a sin is when a person knows to do good and reaches for the bottle and tries to drown out the sorrow some other way than looking to Jesus. Who wants to do that What you're trying to get something else to do? It's like turning to another God. It's not a thing that said, you shouldn't do this, thou shalt not. We're not setting a lot of rules. But God said, I'll put my rules in your heart. I place my law in your heart. He said, I'm looking for a soft heart. I'm going to make the hard-hearted person to be soft-hearted, to be able to receive the things of God. So, so we don't need to be trying to uh, emphasize the things that are bad. You know, cigarettes are bad for you. Uh, because it seems to it seems to be one thing on a list because you start naming the things the list is so large who's, who can name all the things that are bad really if you try to put commandments out here in the 21st century for everybody to live by today there are not enough books big enough i mean this is bigger than obamacare book it's big there are not enough books to write all the rules of god in today there are more commandments than you can read in the Old Testament. And these, these rules of God today include everything that God ever stood for. Anything that was ever an abomination to God is an abomination today. There are some things that he instructed in order to protect the people because they didn't have doctors. They didn't have hospitals that had the knowledge that man has today. And there were some things that he instructed them not to eat. And we need to always bear in mind there are some things that God himself knowing what's wise that men didn't know yet told them don't eat that don't eat that that's nasty stay away from this he was trying to let them know there's some things that you shouldn't shouldn't eat so that you can preserve your life because he knew what we would know in the 21st century it's not good for you it wasn't a heaven and hell commandment for all time but for them it was like it's a rule and i'm protecting you you don't have to understand it i was listening to some preaching and the guy said 
Jesus is your healer. And then somebody said, well, I'm not sick. I need a lawyer. And he said, well, then he's your lawyer. And somebody else said, well, I don't need a lawyer. I need a judge. And he said, well, he's your judge. And he ran through everything. And I'm like, yeah, that's real good. But we need to understand Jesus is God. And then I started wrapping my head around that. They're like, the healing's in the house. And I'm like, God's in the house. What's going to happen? So I thank the Lord for that revelation. And I thank him that God is accessible to each and every human being who will believe on him through Jesus Christ, the son. And we just don't know how much victory and abundance is truly available. I love the Lord. And now... The pastor of this church I attend announces we're in the middle of revival and we're about to be coming to church like five days a week. Now, in the midst of this, I'm the most depressed, the most sick, and the most broke I've ever been in my life. And on the flip of that, I have all these wonderful opportunities coming at me, but every five minutes, the details change. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to trust God and just let him bless me. I don't need to know what's going to happen. If I trust him, he can do much more than my brain can conceive. Now, in order for a revival to happen in a city, someone needs to care that the people in the city get saved. So I was sitting here in the midst of all my whatever last week on Sunday, and I said, Lord, give me that compassion, you know, do something for me. So all these things have been happening. The first thing that happened was Sister Margaret got up here on Sunday, and she looked like a, a little girl. You know, she had this look about her so innocent and, like, so young. And I had remembered her testimony from a few nights before about some things that happened to her in her childhood, and it broke me. I was almost crying in my seat, like, wow, that should have never happened to her. That should have really never happened to her. Why did that have to happen? And from there, you know, it's like every person I'm meeting, it's just a broken heart, a broken heart that needs to be mended. People did not be born and then intend to live these broken lives. They do not know that there's a way out. All they're doing is looking for relief, relief from their own self, relief from what they've become, and relief from the past. And that's what Jesus Christ can do for you, make you a new creature in Christ. And there's nothing like coming to church with great expectation. Uh, the same way you go to prayer with great expectation, because great things can happen when we pour our soul out unto God. And uh, like the pastor said, if you could just get past the whirlwind and uh, listen for that voice that speaks in the midst of the whirlwind. And uh, calls our attention to him and not all the stuff that causes the whirlwind. Because uh, there's plenty of that. There's plenty of that. But, uh, but God is the answer. He's always the answer. And he's a consistent answer. He always has a blueprint that identifies who he is. And, uh, and when you learn to identify who he is, the way he speaks, the way he moves, the way he operates, uh, your life becomes a whole lot easier. Just refuse to be defeated.
but save a sinner like me. Thank you, Jesus. To tell the whole wide world that salvation, salvation is free. There, there was time. When I, I didn't do right But you watched over me Both day and night oh, yes, That's why I want to say yes, he did. Your grace and mercy yeah, yeah. Has brought It brought me through. 
of Eve. She chose to listen to that that seemed right. It seems okay. It tastes good. It looks good. So she did it because she made a decision. Then she offered it to Adam who had the command of God in his life. He's the one that really messed up because he needed to say no to her. But he didn't say no. He had a choice to make so he made his choice and doomed the entire human race. And now today, <laughs> we're, we're, we're penalized because of their mistake, especially Adam's mistake. But God gave us another Adam that never failed, and Jesus is his name. Th this is, he's called in the New Testament the second Adam. The second Adam did not listen to the devil. The devil took him in a high place and said, look, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you everything you look at. And, and the second Adam said, listen, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And after saying no about three times, Slewfoot just went ahead and gave up and left him. Amen. That's what we need to learn to do. Learn from the second Adam, and don't try to pattern after the first Adam. Because we have that Adamic nature within us. We've got that which is wanting to say, go ahead, let me try some of that. Let me see, let me see how that's like. Let me, let me check that out. And we get ourselves in a big mess. But if we can just learn to say no and say no again, no matter opportunity, money, prestige, a career like you never would have dreamed of you could have, just say no unless you have prayed and God says, go ahead, because you can do that because I know you. And I know that I'm first in your life. Some of the richest people in the world today are serving God. But the love of money is the root of all evil. How can they serve God with so much money? The word didn't say that money is the root of all evil. No more than it said whiskey is the root of all evil. Or marijuana is the root of all evil. Or crack cocaine is the root of all evil. You can blame it all on that stuff if you want to. But the root of all evil is disobedience to God.
I am so grateful that the Lord is patient with all of us and he does make a way for us. And that's what this is all about, is to make a way that you can come to God and worship him in spirit and in truth the way he wants us to. That's what it's all about. Um, I want to sing a song. Um, I don't really know what it's called, but I'm just going to sing it. Um, open the eyes of the blind. Water that's turned into wine. There's no one like you. No. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher. Open the eyes of the blind Water that's turned into wine There's no one like you None like you oh. Our God I love God because he first loved me, and all his promises are forever. He said, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. His yes. grace is sufficient for me. Therefore, I cannot fail. If I fall, I'll get back up, and it's just the way it is, and I thank him for it. Amen. I was thinking about something that happened early in my walk with God today. I had... um come from this world where I had no morals at all. And everyone I ever associated with had the same mentality, get money. And it didn't matter how you got it, and it always came. And I was so broke when I came to God for so, so, so long. And I had um, you know, to give up all my drugs, which mean I had nothing to make me feel good. I had to give up my men. So here I am all alone with no money, no friends. I hadn't had a, any kind of really relationships with people in the church. I knew Brother Philip, and, you know, sometimes he would minister to me or help me out, but I wasn't friends with the church people yet. I had um, my Bible and Jesus and a baby. So I'm in this apartment with no job, nothing but hope. And it was Mother's Day, and he, my son was probably Dijon size. And I remember I was so, so broken inside. Um, my son's father is dead now, but at that time he was alive, and he didn't even call me. And nobody I know bought me anything or called me, and I was just outside waiting for church, just like so hurting and feeling like no one cares about me, no one cares about this kid, and I was just 
devastated and this lady pulled over and got out of her car and gave me a big bouquet of flowers and was like, happy Mother's Day and drove off. And that touched my heart in such a way because I, I was just like, wow, Jesus, you know, he cares that much to know how badly I was hurting and to come to me like that. And I will never, ever, ever forget that. And I thank him for everything that he has done for me from then till now. And I've never made the same amount of money I made before I came to God. Not, not in a job. I made more in a job then. And I definitely made more illegally. Or you know what I mean. But um, I have so much more now than I've ever had then. Because all that money would just like flush down the toilet. And I thank him. He says, what little the righteous has is better than all the treasures of the wicked. Everything God promises is for real. And I am very, very, very happy to be here. I, um, I thank the God to be part of this church because a lot of people have always asked me, why do you go to church there? Because I want to know that when I need somebody to pray me through, they know what they're doing that they are saved, that they are living a holy life. And I thank God to be here. Amen. You choose this day who you will serve several times a day. We often have this that we can do or this we shouldn't do or this we know we should do. Sometimes you can just feel so guilty because you didn't do some things. Just sit around and think, and even your thinking becomes a problem. Because sometimes we just need to choose how we're going to think about. You start thinking on some things that seem right, seem good, make you feel good. And then the next thing you know, you, you're trying to maybe let those thoughts drive you into something that you thought you would never do. It's best to gird up the loins of your mind because they tend to bring other little things with them that have suggestions that will take you into some places where we shouldn't be. But if you get enough of that saying, go, 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 do this, Amen. If we don't say no somewhere, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until we find ourselves not even choosing anymore. We just go. And it doesn't really matter, you know, right now what's going to happen because we're not thinking about what's going to happen afterward. It's just how good it feels to be on our way. And we try to, try to even drown out the thoughts, you shouldn't be doing this. Just do it and don't think. That's how banks get robbed and that's how people get killed, murdered, because it starts out with a thought. An idea. And then they take that step in that direction. You have to choose to take that step. And then they go a little further, and then it gets a little easier, and then they stop thinking about the consequences. Just think about the goal. Just think about taste it. Just think about grabbing it. Just think about trying it. Next thing you know, they're crying out from some, some prison. Can, can you have the preacher come and visit me? Or crying out in some car wreck, please pray. Or some terminal disease, oh, Oh, somebody do something. Because life is so short, and the penalties of sin are all not, always not just heaven uh, versus hell, but it's life or death today. We choose the right choices, make the right choices, and we can have life, abundant life now and eternally in heaven. Or we can die a slow death. Amen. We can hurt on the way to hell.